Hello guys, welcome back to another lecture. Today we're going to be going over pretty briefly Romanticism in Spain, but this will be our first look at Romanticism to give you an idea. After this we'll go over Romanticism in Germany, England, France. It's pretty broad and pretty encompassing and a very dominant part of the 19th century, perhaps the most dominant and, in my opinion, the best. I think Romanticism is pretty awesome. Obviously every ideology has its faults and there will be reactions to it later that we will get to, which perhaps are justified. Uh, but still, we're going to be looking at Romanticism in Spain. We're going to look at a total of five artists, but we're going to heavily focus on one who's the biggest player, and that's Francisco Goya. But either way, please feel free to like and subscribe, comment. I greatly appreciate it. We're going through all of the 19th century, so make sure to stick around. Get that. Okay, so Romanticism in Spain. Romanticism is kind of what it sounds like, not explicitly. Romanticism is largely based off the aesthetic that they liked from mostly the mid mid Middle Ages, from medieval time, from those romance countries. And that's lar that's actually where it comes from specifically, but a lot of it is what we understand to be romanticized. Things are a bit more romantic. We make things a bit more dramatic, especially in response to neoclassicism. Neoclassicism brings us a lot of good thought that enlightenment thinkers are definitely worth looking into but it was supposed to bring us a lot of reform and instead of a lot of reform necessarily we got a lot of revolution and they were bloody revolutions people died so a lot of people did not think highly of it in hindsight because although their ideals may have been lofty and good who cares if all that comes from it is death and of course, they could have been distorting it, bastardizing it, what have you. And uh, evil people definitely could and did take advantage of these things um, and the people's sentiments. But regardless, we're kind of disillusioned with the Enlightenment ideals during the age of Romanticism. And uh, you can even see it here in this first one, which we'll talk a little bit more about. This is not a glorifying, this is not glorifying violence, essentially, or glorifying war as neoclassicism would. This is not heroic. This is sad. This is dark. Um, this is the true result of war. And then uh, just to give you guys a little idea, because I like all of the liberal arts, really, it's uh, these are just a few other people that are romanticists, really, in Spain. Just a few. There are a lot more, of course. Jose de Esperanza is a poet. Nicomedes Pastor Diaz Corbel is an author. He was a he's an interesting one because he's from uh, Galicia, which is in northwestern Spain, and they speak their own dialect, Galician. Galician. I don't. I'm not very good with other languages yet. But regardless, he kind of uh, led the surge for that to come back, and so he was kind of like a not only a Spanish nationalist, but he's he has a great national like sense of nationalism and love. For his region, Galicia, which is a bit more unique than perhaps some other regions in some regards. It's got a lot of ties to Celtic. In fact, some people call it the seventh Celtic nation, although they don't speak a Celtic language anymore, so most people do not include them. But either way, he's actually a, he was a politician and a journalist as well, which are I tend to think of as negative things. So I put author there instead, which he also was. And then um, Angel de Saavedra, poet and dramatist. We also get Jose Zoria, which is same kind of stuff. We get these playwrights and stuff like that, also writing poetry, which is a lost art. Come on, people. And then Gustavo Adolfo Biquier was a writer, also very handsome. And then uh, he was also pretty famous, maybe because of that, too. But then uh, Rosalia de Castro, another poet and novelist. And, uh, yeah, these are definitely just interesting people worth looking at. And, again, just to reiterate, that idea of romanticism, it was derived from a nostalgia, essentially, for medieval, like, chivalric literature written in Romance languages. And so here are some good points for Romanticism. So Romanticism has a fascination with many things, and you'll find Romanticism even has more variance in style than even Neoclassicism does. A lot of artists will have their own different styles, but and they won't focus on all of these, necessarily, but they usually hit some of the boxes, right? So, uh, power of nature and the sublime. We do like that. We'll see that a lot in landscapes. The landscapes during the Romantic era are very nice. 
I'm not sure we look at any landscapes today. Uh, and then exoticism. We like exotic locales. A big one is that gets paired with that a lot is Orientalism. Orientalism is kind of like a subcategory of Romanticism, and that's an interest in the Orient, which just pretty much means Eastern. We what we call the Orient today would be like China, like the Far East, but for them the Orient would be the Near East, like the Middle Middle East, uh, and then especially for the people in Spain, Morocco is more you know right there or just across uh, the Strait there. Um, but we are interested in those exotic cultures. And we like the supernatural, interest in the supernatural definitely as well. That kind of gets paired with that uh, power of nature. And then the violent and horrific themes. So we, we saw some relatively violent themes in neoclassicism, but it's much more idealized to not be so garish and in your face during neoclassicism. And they're going to make it more in your face. It's going to be more horrific. They're going to not really... They are going to put their own spin on it. I like you could say it's perhaps not still the most uh, truthful representations, but they are still perhaps more accurate representations. And then nationalism is still a thing, though. Uh, nationalism is always a thing. Let's be honest. Like until today, it's it's kind of frowned upon in the West. Obviously, people are still heavily nationalistic. As you should love your country, and don't love your government, though. Or was it Mark Twain? I love my country, but I am only like love my government when it deserves it pretty much which is pretty much never <laughs> so there's that and then longing for the past so that sense of nostalgia again uh we're gonna idealize the past which is good in some regards can be unhealthy uh, but we get a lot of intense emotion and passion uh, not as stoic as the neoclassical art and then we do focus a little bit more on stuff on things like fantasy and dreams. Yeah, I think romanticizing the past actually is not inherently a bad thing. It's bad when it's like, you know, uses justification for ethnic cleansing and stuff like that, which it has been. And that's why you get nationalism as such a bad, bad name today. But that's, it's not really fair to say that's all nationalism is. The Nazis were nationalistic, but so were the British and the French that fought against them. And we don't think of them as evil, do we? And then, uh... We get more of this interest in the inner self, and this will be expressed a lot in that fantasy, like the dreams will be expressed in moods and our dreams, and this fantasy of the religion and superstition as well. And also kind of a romantic interest in childhood, which is kind of still carried over by Rousseau, uh, that Rousseau stuff, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which we talked about a little bit in Neoclassical. Uh, again, talking about that because Rousseau talked about the return to nature and a child to child children are very like natural in that regard. Um, but also the importance of passion as a driving force of human existence. We, you have to have passion, imagination, stuff like that. And, uh, child rearing in a natural environment, which again, we went over a little bit last time. Okay. But this is the big guy from Spain. But this is the big guy, um, and this is the one we're going to talk, look at the most. And this is Francisco Goya. This is a self-portrait of him. He So he is from Spain. He studied in Madrid uh, with uh, Anton Rafael Mings, who we looked at a portrait of him. We looked at one of his uh, last time. Uh, he did tour Italy like most of these artists would. He returned to Madrid, though, and was made a court painter to uh, Charles III and his son, Charles IV. And uh, it's the same position that someone like uh, Diego Velázquez had already hold in the, already held in the 17th century, who's perhaps the most famous Spanish artist, at least at this point. Picasso might be the most famous now. But at least during the 19th century, Velázquez is like, he's still a big name, right? And uh, a lot like uh, Hogarth, who we also haven't really talked about, he likes, he, he painted criticisms of society. He, he definitely was harsh on society, which I can understand. I feel like I'm not a I'm not a teacher. I'm not like an expert on lots of this stuff. I'm a critic, is what I am, uh, which may or may not be good. So, but he, Goya's uh, depictions, because of that, are relatively blunt, unadorned. We looked at this in the introduction, just to give you an idea. So there are some representations that we see in more popular media. You could say this is a son of a count and countess right here that is being depicted, and uh, this is. Uh, shown with his bird 
which I hope you guys recognize what it is. I'm not sure how po how popular this bird is outside the Western United States, at least in the United States. That's a magpie, so the cousin to a crow. And it's holding the painter's card, actually, in its beak. But in the back, we also get the cage full of finches. And then three cats that are very wide-eyed staring at the magpie. This may be a commentary on the fleeting nature of innocence and youth, especially considering that the sitter here, Manuel, he died when he was eight years old. Here's a detail of the magpie and the cats. Magpies are very smart, just like the crows and ravens are and such. Here is the witch's Sabbath, which I feel like a lot of people in today's environment with their just complete rejection of Christianity, but still having a desire of spirituality and rejecting that which is mainstream, I guess you could say they, they like stuff like this. <laughs> Uh, but the goat is the devil, of course, as you can see here. This might be an initiation rite on the child, as you see there, but like on the the, the living child, because there's a child beneath it that is obviously dead. And then, uh, but there's a woman like carrying her plump newborn baby. Or not newborn necessarily, but you know, a young child. But the devil was believed to have fed on children at the time. So this is kind of typical just of imagery of witchcraft. And uh, many of the symbols used are just uh, inverted. We get the crescent moon inverted, the left hand over the child. And these are opposite of, the, the crescent moon generally would not be facing out of the canvas like that. And we get the right hand as a sign, the symbol of blessing with Christ generally, and he's using his left hand. Uh, but this is kind of a protest against the uh, Bosque uh, witch hunts, which occurred during the Spanish Inquisition. So it's kind of, a t he's also just like attacking superstitious beliefs that were rife in Spain during a period when like tales of midnight gatherings of witches and the appearance of the devil were common among, especially among the rural populace. So it's kind of, he's kind of reflecting the disdain for the popular tendency towards superstition and the church, church led, it in fact, returned to medieval fears. So he's not a fan of that. And, uh. He's kind of mocking what he saw as medieval fears exploited by the established order for political and capital gain. So this one we actually looked at in the introduction, so it might be recognizable to a degree. This is The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters from 1799. So this is part of a series of 80 prints. So there, are, there are a lot of them uh, called Los Caprichos, and it was published in a uh, newspaper in Madrid. And he's largely attacking the principle that kings rule by divine right. And he also attacks the Catholic Church and just popular superstitions and also expose the horrors of war, which is something we weren't doing in the last period, remember? So this is actually a self-portrait of him asleep at a desk. So if you remember from the introduction, he's, his argument here is that imagination needs to be united with reason. Someone like William Blake, the Englishman, famous poet, but also does create art, we'll look at him when we get to England, is that Blake thought that reason stifled imagination and Goya is like, you need to have reason, like reason and imagination should work in tandem, essentially. It should be united. But he's seen himself as a visionary here as he's sleeping. He's having a, essentially a vision, right? I guess you could say a dream. And this is around the time, about a year after Goya himself suffered an illness and he became, he became deaf, actually. And he had a horrible buzzing in his ear that actually made him essentially eventually go mad. And we'll see that reflected in some of his uh, later works. Regardless, but he, uh, Goya himself definitely favored social reform, but again, as that enlightenment became associated with revolution rather than reform, and then Spain also went to war with France and was essentially conquered. Napoleon's brother was put in charge as like a pseudo monarch of France, and it just was not a fun time, pretty much at all. And, uh, Goya himself having his own personal problems, becoming ill and whatnot, just he was having a tough time, to put it simply. And you could perhaps see that in this image itself. But we get like this geometric block here on the bottom left, and that kind of represents reason. And we get the owls though, uh, the owls and bats, they in this instance are representing folly, ignorance. Uh, so it's kind of the logical versus the emotional and Ill, um, illogical. So kind of relating to the out of control events that are occurring during his life that are on a national level, but also on a personal level. And uh, 
many of the prints in Los Capichos series kind of express just a disdain, pretty much, for pre-enlightenment practices still popular in Spain at the end of the 18th century. So, so like, we appreciate the Enlightenment in some regards because it helps get rid of these things we didn't like. But it doesn't end up being as promising as we hoped it would be. Because the Enlightenment did help to to get it down to a lower degree, I guess. Um, some of the things, like uh, arranged marriages, that superstition, powerful clergy. And he's using this again to just critique contemporary Spanish society and this is number 43 in Los Caprichos and the full uh, epigraph for it actually goes fantasy abandoned by reason produces impossible monsters united with her she is the mother of the arts and the origin of their marvels which is really interesting actually here is another one the hobgoblins so this is a satirical if you can't tell perhaps by the garb necessarily if you're not acquainted uh, with it is this is a satirical depiction of the clergy so hobgoblins were creatures pretty much believed to have uh, joined with satan when he was expelled from heaven so rather than descent to hell they inhabit the human world though in spain the term uh duendecitos so or hobgoblins was popularly applied to friars especially when depicting them in a derogatory light speaking negatively of them so the, we obviously get these grotesque figures and on the left, that guy's eating the bread and the wine, so, of course, uh, suggesting the Eucharist, but also his own greed. And then on the right, we get the guy on the right is hiding his uh, glasses of wine beneath his coat, beneath his cloak. And then the center, he looks like a priest with a black robe and buckled shoes, uh, but he also, of course, looks like a monster. And he's also drinking secretly, implies that essentially a, a greedy clergy was cannibalizing Spain at a time when the church was the wealthiest institution in the country. And they are wild beasts from the disasters of war. So uh, Napoleon's armies overran Spain in around 1808. And uh, Goya recorded the war in a series of uh, another 80 etchings uh, called the disasters of war. So that's what he says from the disasters of war here. But it was not made public until after his death. Uh, perhaps it would not have been welcomed especially not if napoleon's people were still in charge but else it's pretty much just illustrating his opposition to war uh, i was inspired here by the 1808 siege of saragossa shows napoleon's troops fighting spanish women who went to the barricades and fought with bricks and stones so a contemporary accounts of the battle likened the resisting spaniards to wild animals defending their homes and children and the women on the left uh here prefers to hurl a rock at the soldiers we also get the reclining woman below her, which is reminiscent of dying classical heroes and heroines. But we do also get classical Christian symbolism. The woman with the bare bottom child <laughs> here refers to a biblical massacre of the innocents as well. So kind of uh, likening Napoleon's army uh, to King Herod's soldiers. Which is to say we don't think well of them. This is the one that was on the cover. This is a very famous one. This is perhaps the best one to know, although there are some other ones people like a lot that we'll look at too. Uh, this is the 3rd of May. So, 3rd of May, 1808, you should say. Most most commonly just called the 3rd of May. But this was a... So, Spain was occupied by Napoleon's troops. Uh, Napoleon put his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne in Madrid. And actually, at first, the Spaniards supported Napoleon's ideals. And they even made friends with the troops. But there were a series of atrocities that they committed, and they rapidly became disillusioned. So a group of Spaniards rebelled against the French invasion on the 2nd of May. And then the following day, the French army executed them, of course, without trial. And every citizen of Madrid suspected of having participated in the uprising on the 2nd was just killed. So a firing squad was set up to shoot anyone who appeared in the streets as well. But we get a vivid portrayal of the brutalities. It's like very much an indictment against the French troops. And this is kind of like a history painting, but this is very recent past. Again, this is six years prior. So even more contemporary than the Benjamin West uh, death of General Wolfe we looked at in neoclassicism. So kind of a precedent to photojournalism, which of course becomes more popular when we get photography uh, here in... 30 plus years or so, 30 around 30 years. But also just a commentary on what happens when people lose control of reason. 
like we like the neoclassical reason but the people but these ideals like they're supposed like reason was the foundation and then they just completely abandoned it you know so but we also do get uh christian symbolism with especially this man here in the, on the left with the tan trousers and the white shirt he has his uh, arms raised as in a crucifix lots of cru we can always think of the the latin cross the t-shaped cross almost uh but there are lots of crosses that were x uh, x shaped so that happened but the uh so this is arm raised in a crucifix we also you know this is repeated in this figure on the ground on the left who's already died and then we kind of get this uh semicircle around the figure in white as if in a in an apse which is like the semicircular place behind the altar generally in a church so it's kind of so like the apse surrounding the crucifix figure place on an altar in a church uh, and we do get a church in the background actually as well but this is very much indebted to the baroque we get the very strong contrast and light for impact but also what's interesting is that these are not specific people they're all anonymous nobodies we get the christ-like figure of course but he is still showing his fear compared to you know someone like the oath of the Harati by david that was like they were going to their death and they were not showing any fear whatsoever so we're being a bit more honest in that regard but we do get this clearly structured pattern of light and dark uh, that definitely gives the impact. So we're looking at Caravaggio, definitely from the Baroque era. Uh, but the firing squad itself is also interesting. They're, they're faceless. You know, they have this mechanical uniformity as they're all in a line here. But this is not heroic. This is a protest against war. And it's also a real event, but pretty universal in significance. Any, uh, once the troops were expelled in 1814, Napoleon's troops were expelled in 1814, that's when Goya asked for the commission to paint this. Because I guess, well, he finally could, essentially. So this is the family of Charles IV. This is supposed to be propaganda, largely, uh, to affirm the family's divine privilege and superiority. But he kind of subtly just exposes their ordinariness. They approved this, so obviously they didn't care that much. They didn't even look, I guess, that hard. But these are the members of the royal family and... Yeah, I guess they're oblivious to the negative light he uh, he paints them in. And perhaps, I mean, we aren't, uh, we're pretty oblivious to in some regards too. They, this girl over here on the left isn't even looking. The old lady behind her looks a bit deranged almost. They're all just like a, the main two characters here in the middle are kind of just chubby. And they're just like, they don't, they're nothing, they're nothing special. Yeah, I guess that Shake says, any publicity is good publicity, like, our likeness is still there so who cares um but it's also he's just kind of chronicling the decadence and the decline of the spanish monarchy uh so goya actually did mean it to be compared to las meninas uh, which is a very famous velasquez painting that he would be acquainted with everyone in the court in fact would be acquainted with it and that queen marisa uh maria luisa in the middle kind of striking the same pose as uh, velasquez's uh, infanta so the question is, though, like, what are they looking at? There is no mirror, that missing element uh, that involves the reader as Velasquez, which I'll show you guys just a reference here in a second. Um, so it's kind of just has a sense of like awkwardness, a little uncomfortable. But of course, he the, is a talented painter still. We have the dynamic handling of paints, uh, paint on clothes, jewelry, metals. And Charles IV didn't reject it. So I mean, good enough, right? This is the one he's referencing. You can see the same like turn of the head. It looks a lot more awkward on the queen rather than the young princess here and he has the easel that i don't know if you guys noticed the, the easel him with him in the background painting it on the left there that is a reference to this velasquez las maninas which is a very famous painting again they all would have been acquainted with it and again here's just a side-by-side -side comparison to give you an idea of what we're looking at neoclassicism on the left romances on the right not only do you get the loose brush strokes and stuff like that might much more austere on the left much more stoic and heroic sense we're definitely idealizing it more so it is serving a purpose here on the right trying to show the brutalities of war and this is prob this is something that happened but of course this is probably not you know an explicit imagery uh from it although it probably is relatively similar so perhaps i mean still being a bit more honest on the right for goya and these would have been, 
I think 30 years apart. So re relatively not that far apart. This is what Goya is pretty famous for in many regards too. This is, if anyone is acquainted with the Goya, Goya, a lot of people, this is what they're acquainted with. Uh, this is Saturn devouring his son. So this is called, these are called his black paintings. And these are pretty much the last paintings he makes before he dies. Uh, so he pretty much devolves into madness. Uh, loses his hearing, but he has that constant like buzzing in his ear, and he just kind of uh, shuts himself in the walls of his own home. And he actually painted these on the walls of his homes. These are not painted on canvas. But we get lots of symbols of incomprehensible cruelty, really. Uh, lots of, uh, definitely see a fascination with the irrational. And this, of course, is from the prophet uh, that one of Saturn's sons would dethrone him, so he eats them. But also just kind of about corrupt power, like power of turning on one's own, kind of like Napoleon. But we get this like very fleshy, meaty, the boniness even as well, quality of the figures. Very different. And here's the same story. Not as grotesque. This, of course, is a kind of a grotesque story in itself, I suppose you could say. This is Peter Paul Rubens, a Baroque artist. Uh, Dutch Baroque and the uh, depiction of it, but Goya's is a bit more deranged, certainly. But here's another one from the Los Caprichos. Can't anyone untie us? In the, in the comments for this is a uh, a man and a woman tied together with ropes, struggling to get loose and crying out to be untied quickly. Either I am mistaken, or they are two people who have been forced to marry. It's about, like, a, you know, critique against arranged marriages and stuff, that they're miserable and just suffering under the power of this demonic owl. So, again, just to see the different types of critiques that he had. But that's it for Goya. We have, we're going to look at a few more artists, just very briefly. Uh, Goya is easily the most well-known of all of these artists. Uh, but there are other artists, of course, who are good. You can already kind of see it there, but this is uh, Antonio Gisbert. He was perhaps most famously director of the Prado for about five years during his life. Prado probably, I would say, probably the most famous museum in Spain. And some people would put him in realism, some people would put him in romanticism. He kind of lies on the cusp, like sits in between realism and romanticism, and we'll look at realism later. But regardless, there's this one work that is relatively romantic it's this is almost like a good uh meld between the oath of the harati by david which is very neoclassical and the third of may by goya which is way very dramatic and this is not as dramatic but it's also not as stoic and it's still showing you the harsh uh reality so this is the execution of torrijos and his companions on the beach at malaga from 1888 so a little bit later this one was actually commissioned by the prime minister of spain uh paxides mateo sagasta and it's trying. We're trying to show Spain, like the Spanish nation, as a defender of liberty. Uh, Torrijos himself fought for Spanish independence, and then was executed when he came back to Spain because he had been in England for some time. He landed on a beach. He was betrayed by the local governor who had led him on to believe that you know he'd be fine. And uh, him and his 60 men with him were arrested. And just a few days later, him and 48 of those men were executed without trial, of course. And that was uh, under the order of Ferdinand VII, who was the king. So he was a very hated king. He's actually the king that Spain loses most of their territory in the Americas, like Puerto Rico and Cuba uh, and stuff like that. They did not like him, <laughs> at least in hindsight, they did not like him. And he has uh, Torrijos executed here, which he is actually this figure in the brown cloak, not the hooded figures, not the monks who are trying to comfort people by providing them blindfolds and stuff, say prayers for them. And these are like some of his generals, the old minister of war on our right, his left. Uh, and this figure, the thir three to the left of him, I think is an Englishman, but the rest of them are mostly Spaniards. And there's already a few of them that have been executed. And again, we get the files, the ranks of the soldiers behind them who will be doing the executing, who again are kind of lifeless, emotionless, don't have character. Uh, but you can see the the thoughts on these people's faces. So we're not really glorifying the violence, but we are using it to our advantage, right? We're painting it as again, that national sentiment, but not only like the national sentiment, I mean, a king, did this but we're trying to we're being we're gonna be better than that essentially spanish nation building is gonna be a bit more 
honest. We're going to defend liberty, you know, unlike rather than execute people who love it. So but we get gore in front of the suspense of what is coming to them because of they will all be all, all the men here will be executed. Another guy, Francisco Padilla Ortiz. This is a self-portrait. It's actually a relatively late self-portrait from 1917. He was another Spanish man, another Spaniard. He started at the Spanish Academy in Rome uh, when that was pretty new. And he's his style is a bit different. He's largely associated with academicism, I guess is how it said. Uh, so pretty much just the there's a certain like style that is associated with the academic art schools, and uh, I guess they say he fits in that. The painting we're gonna look at though is a bit more on the romantic side though. So, but he's actually his paintings are really nice. I recommend looking at them, even if they're not necessarily romantic. I think there tends to be a general romantic uh, flair to them. But this is Queen. Joanna the Mad, or Joanna la Loca, I believe is what it's called in Spanish. So, uh, but this is a, his a history painting, so this is relatively, well, I guess you could say a historical painting. This is Joanna of Castile, uh, and this is the coffin or the casket of her dead husband, Philip I of Castile. And uh, he died suddenly of typhoid fever, and she would carry the casket around with her thinking that one day he would awake from his sleep essentially and so she was often used to embody love honor but also death and madness hence her name so a bit odd uh, none of the courtesans like members of the court over here seem to care at all uh on the right or even on the left really so it's just her and she's obviously distraught by it but just the idea of uh madness itself in some regards is kind of a romantic notion or is heavily romanticized in things like this uh so this is very romantic i think <laughs> as far as you know romanticism goes and this is antonio maria Escobar. i don't know how to, i might have probably butchered that but this is a self-portrait again from 1847 uh he was born and trained in seville sevilla he uh I'm sure he, I know he did some time like outside there, like going to Rome and stuff like that, but he went, he went to art school pretty much in Sevilla as well, as well as being born there. I guess a more interesting thing about him is he lost his vision with a sickness at one point and tried to kill himself, but that didn't work. And so he recovered, largely became a portrait painter. He did also write a book on art, like art theory that I don't really know anything about, but I know the name, uh, Tratado de uh, Anatomia Pictoria, um, treaty on the anatomy of pictures or something um or images i don't know but here's one it still give you an idea that uh we may critique the catholic church like goya does pretty heavily but it's still a big part of a lot of people's lives in spain during this period i'm not so sure about now I'm not too up to date with contemporary spain the virgin mary the infant christ and the holy spirit with angels in the background so a long title but just to give you an idea you know this stuff is still happening this is not explicitly romantic to be honest, this is something you see a lot ever since the advent of Christianity, but it's something that I feel like we stop looking at once you get out of the Middle Ages and stuff. We stop looking at these, especially, or perhaps the Renaissance that we see a lot of Madonna as a child, but uh, it's still definitely happening. I think Christ looks pretty good here. I've seen a lot of ugly baby Jesuses in paintings, uh, but, and then of course the Holy Spirit is the dove, represented in the dove here, but looks pretty good. It's relatively austere, almost kind of, with, if the background didn't have a bunch of angels, uh, it would look pretty neoclassical, but perhaps that's what romanticizes it again, again, especially the just floating heads, <laughs> um, not, they don't even have full bodies and stuff. Okay, and the last guy we're going to look at pretty shortly, this is uh, Maria Fortuny, Marsal, generally just called Maria Fortuny. This is a self-portrait either 1863 or 1873, not exactly sure. But then uh, he he paints a lot of genre paintings and a lot of military paintings. Uh, but he also does dabble in Orientalism, which again is kind of that, like a subcategory of Romanticism. And especially for the people in Spain, the place they would be looking at a lot is Morocco, which is quite close. Uh, he was from Catalonia. And he died pretty young, although he is quite famous. Uh, Goya probably being the most famous, he might be most famous, He perhaps the most famous during his lifetime, and perhaps is just more well-known in Spain now. 
but he only he only lived to be 35 he died pretty young i'm gonna look at a couple here just really briefly you can see the very loose brushwork here it's kind of reminiscent of uh joseph mallard william turner the english artist romantic artist which is pretty famous for his very very loose brushwork which is when we first really see that uh really well but this is a uh, fantasia fasto which if you can't guess is the fantasy of faust so faust came out in 1808 by Goethe, and uh we like him <laughs> But it's also this is mostly for his love of music and kind of a homage to uh, Jean uh, Baptiste Pujol, who was a composer and pianist uh, during Fortuny's day, though which is pretty much what you see on the right, and then you have like the figures kind of floating uh, to the left after that, and kind of all up in a haze. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it's from 1866, and just to show you, give you an example of Orientalism. This is a common subject with Oriental. Uh, depictions the odalisk which is pretty much a female concubine or slave you could say uh, in a muslim harem more specifically i think the term is turkish uh, for more specifically turkish harems i think it gets applied pretty generally when we're doing oriental art and this is a quite a common depiction of orientalism will show naked women not usually pornographic although that does happen it is still, although not pornographic, it is still sensual. She is supposed to be alluring. And although we do still get the relatively loose brushwork, not as loose as in his Fantasia Fausto, uh, Fausto. It's pretty loose, but you can still, you still really see the detail on all the cloth, uh, different cloths and fabrics and stuff like that. So it looks really good still. I think he's obviously very talented. So the man himself has a, a bergama, which is just like a stringed instrument. Yes, this is why we love the Orient. It's just because we get we get women. Men love women, of course. But the uh, I don't I don't think that's explicitly why they're interested. <laughs> but still, and this was exhibited uh, at the National Art Museum in Catalonia, as well. So, yeah, that's it for romanticism in Spain. There you have it. <laughs> um, definitely interesting. I would highly recommend looking into some of those artists more if you are interested. Next time. We're continuing with romanticism. I th I'd have to double check, but I believe it's romanticism in Germany next. Uh, I'll have to, again, double check that. But either way, please feel free to leave any questions if you have any in the comments. Or at the very least, if you don't have any questions, leave a comment for what was your favorite work uh, or perhaps favorite artist. Generally speaking, we didn't look at a few for... We only looked at a single work for three of the five artists, so I mean, not too much going on, and we looked at the most by far from Goya. But either way, please feel free to like and subscribe. I will be continuing to do this lecture series through the 19th century, and to perhaps do an overarching one uh, or a different period or whatever medium after that. So either way, greatly appreciated if you stuck around this long. But uh, either way, I will see you guys next time. Have a good one.